Good morning and happy Sabbath. Thank you for joining us this morning for worship. We are very glad you are here. Next Sabbath is Regenerate, the Conference Youth, Young Adult and Youth Festival in Cartersville, Georgia. Our GCA students and many of our GCA staff will be worshiping there. However, we will be having a big Sabbath right here at GCA at the same time because next week is Pathfinder slash Adventure Sabbath. Be sure to come and support our young people as they take over the entire worship service, including three Pathfinders who will be preaching. Following church, there will be a South African themed potluck meal. Be sure to check the newsletter for a sign up link for the meal. And now, Pastor Joss has an item to present. Chaplain Josh will be getting up to do his little announcement a little later. Um, why don't we have our praise team come up and we'll start off with praise.
Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Um, forgive me for missing my cue earlier, but we're going to take care of a couple of items of business this morning. We have a couple of uh, transfer readings. So this is the second uh, reading uh, for Christiana Nesmith uh, Sigur Sigara. I may have mispronounced that. Forgive me, Christiana. Um, to the Athelstan, Tennessee Church, SDA Church. Um, we're excited to see her getting into her community there where she's teaching and working. So is there a motion to accept that transfer? Okay, in a uh, second. Okay, all in favor, please raise your right hand. Sure. All right, thank you, that's carried. The second one um, is a transfer in. This is also the second reading for Dulce and Fernando Villaruel to transfer their church membership from the Auburn, Georgia, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Is there a motion to accept the Villaruels? And, and a second? All in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you very much. That carries. I don't know if they're here today, but officially welcome. Yes, we, we, we welcome you officially now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, at this time, uh, we're going to have children's stories, so kids, come on down, and Uncle Jacob has a story for you this morning, so kids, please come on down to the front. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jacob, as many of you may just have heard. But I would like to start off with a question for you guys today. Can I ask a question? How many of you guys have siblings? Oh, wow, there's so many. I have a story today about one of my siblings. Like when, you know, when you have siblings, you have your good times with your siblings where you guys are always together and you have, you know, sometimes they're not so good where you may close the door and like, I don't want to talk to you today. <laughs> Can anybody relate to that who has siblings? Yeah. Um, well, uh, the story today shares a bit of a good and a bad story with one of my siblings. I remember when I was four years old, one of my eldest brothers was just getting a car. I remember them being so excited that they had just got their car. And I remember getting excited too. I was like, oh, this is gonna be so fun. Like he can take me places, he can take me to amusement parks, he can take me everywhere. You know, I wanted to go. I was really excited about this. I didn't always have to ask mom or dad. I have a sibling that I can ask to take me places. So it was a very exciting moment in my early childhood that I remember vividly. I remember um, our first time um, letting him drive. I didn't know what it took to be a good or bad driver. I remember getting in the car with him my first time, and I remember my mom yelling at him, hey, turn, turn like this, turn quicker, um, slow down, go quicker. And I didn't really get what was going on. I was just happy to be in the car riding around with my sibling. A couple days later, my sibling was headed out to go somewhere, and he asked me, okay, I'm going to stop by the store, Jacob. Would you like anything? And I was like, yes, give me all the candy that you can get in that store. That's what I told him to. 
and he's like, mm, I can't get you all of it, but I'll get you something. I would have never thought that that would have been my last conversation with him. And it wasn't. Um, <laughs> well, a couple hours later, my mom was rushing me into the car and we were going to the hospital. And we were, and he had, my sibling had gotten a bad car accident. We can call him Migo, that's his name. His name is Migo. He got in a really bad car accident and he was in the hospital. And I remember sitting there and watching my mom be very eager for the result. And I also remember seeing toys, I played with it while she waited. And as I was playing with the toys at that time, the doctor said something to her and she started crying. This was the saddest I have ever seen my mom be. She cried so much that her face, she's my color, her face turned red. It was very scary because that's how hard she was crying. She was just bawling. And we were, I remember leaving the hospital and she looked very, very sad. And I didn't know why and I asked her why and she didn't answer. But there was this nurse running out and she was like, how do you spell your name? Is it M-I-L-E-S or M-Y-L-E-S? And I remember my mom saying M-I-L-E-S. And she's like, oh, your son is fine. He just had a couple scratches, he's fine. And I remember my mom being very angry at the hospital. I remember my mom threatening to sue the hospital because <laughs> she was so angry because they had announced to her that he was dead and he wasn't. He was alive, he was still there. The loss of a sibling, if you ever lost one or if you ever came close or thought you may have lost one, you're deeply hurt. Although I was too young to understand what hurt was and what death was, I could also um, just be aware how sad she felt and it made me sad. But I was so happy that he's alive, he's still doing well. And that's my sibling. That's my sibling story for you. And even the ones who don't have siblings, you do have siblings. I'm gonna tell you this, everyone out here are your brothers and sisters and we're all one in Christ. No matter, in light of Black History Month, I wanted to make sure to tell this story, no matter the color, no matter what it came from, no matter how different they are, no matter how alike they are, they're your sibling in Christ. God called us to be one body in Christ, to preach his word, to spread his word all over the nations. It's a very exciting time that God called us to do, and I wanted to tell that message to you today. By your heads. Let me help him with pray. Dear gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for siblings. Thank you for my brothers and sisters out here. Many of my brothers and sisters are very different than what I am. Many of them are alike. But we all have one shared goal, and that is to spread your word and to become closer to you, God. Help us today, even through the darkness, even through the light. Help us see you through it all. You're there for us, and you called us to be one. In your name I pray, amen. Stewardship worship is first about relationship, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well, Matthew 6, 33. Stewardship is giving to you as well. I mean, stewardship is giving our all lovingly to the one who lovingly gave his all for us and continues to give his all to us daily. Worshiping God is a joy. The Father is the supreme lover and giver. Jesus is the greatest gift, as John 3, 16 through 17 says. He's our example. The Holy Spirit is our ultimate guide. God's generosity and is revolutionary and relational. Because of our relationship with him, we delight to partner with him in funding the mission, the everlasting gospel to the world. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
The creator exhibits exemplary revolutionary generosity and is worthy to be worshiped. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this amazing opportunity to come to this church and worship you. Please bless the tithes and offerings that we give to you today. Amen. Good. 
Please kneel as far as you were able and close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you today to thank you for everything you've done for us. We ask that you watch over Acro Flyers as they tour in Orlando, Florida, and we also ask that you be there for anyone who is sick from church or in the dorms. And we also want to remind you, God, that we love you and that we're thankful for everything that you've done for us. And in your name we pray, amen.
All right. Let's go, Josh Woods. Another sermon. I never feel prepared enough. I never feel ready. You'd think after 15 years of doing this, you'd finally have it sort of figured out that it'd be easy, that it'd be routine by now, but that's not how I'm feeling this morning. I believe that the Word of God is powerful, but I also know that there are students here today who feel like they're forced to be here. So I want to bring something that's engaging, something that's relevant, while at the same time something that's meaningful and biblical. But can you really do that? Do you really have what it takes? All right, Woods, it's game time. Everybody's watching. Don't screw this up. Let's go. Good morning and happy Sabbath. How's everybody doing today? How many of you, I wonder, how many of you, I wonder, have conversations like these that go through your head on a daily, maybe on a weekly, monthly basis? How many of you have conversations like this with yourself in your own mind? I don't know about you, but there are definitely times in my mind when I just go back and forth on things, right? I go back and forth on being good with God, and then all of a sudden I'm just not feeling like I'm really good with God. I go back and forth with with having peace in my heart. I'm I'm feeling good about life, and then all of a sudden something shifts or something changes or, you know, something happens, and I can just feel that level of anxiety just just creeping up and up and up and and up. I go back and forth. I go back and forth with with trusting God. I don't know, maybe, maybe you can relate. I go back and forth with, with trusting God. I'll have a prayer time or I'll have, I'll have worship with my family. Uh, you know, I'll have a, a conversation that's just really inspiring. And I, and I walk away and I feel good. And I'm like, God, you've got this. I trust you. I know that you created this world. You are good. And, and then all of a sudden I get a text or an email or I have an interaction or, or a conversation that just, just throws it out the door, or maybe something changes in, in my day, and then that trust is gone, right? And then it's like, well, you've got to step in. You've got you've to, you, I need to take control of the situation. I need to control the outcome. I can't, I can't allow God right now. I'm sorry, he's just not moving quick enough in my life. And so I go back and forth. I don't know, maybe, maybe you can relate. Then it's just stressful. I mean, does anybody else have these types of conversations, these ongoing conversations in your mind? Maybe you finally decided that you were going to go all in with school, that you're going to finally try to grow up and, and maybe start studying a little bit, and maybe you're going to really hit some chemistry studying or physics or whatever it is. Maybe it was math. You know, you just decided to study hard, and you studied, and you studied, and you studied, and you get that test back, and it's a 68 are you kidding me? All this effort I put into this, and this is what I get back. And so then you start to have these conversations in your brain and in your mind, and you're saying, well, hey, I'm just never going to measure up. Like, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not going to measure up to, to, to the standard that my, my parents have put on me. I'm never going to measure up even to the standard that I want for myself. Like, I'm never going to be as smart as him or as her. I'm never going to accomplish as much as, as these guys or, 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 you know, whatever. Like, I'm just not going to measure up. That's the message, right? Maybe it's a relationship. I know we don't, you know, have any of that going on. But maybe it's a relationship with a special someone, and everything was going great, and you guys were, were doing well, and then out of nowhere, it wasn't going great, and you weren't, you weren't doing well, and then your mind tells you, well, I thought everything was good, and now it's not, so something must be wrong with me. And even though you know that's not true, or maybe you don't know that that's not true, you should know that that's not true, uh, but that's the message. And that's the conversation that we have with ourselves in our mind. 
Maybe it was a leadership position that you have, or maybe it's, it's a, you're a class officer, or there's something that you're leading here on campus, or maybe it's your job, and you've been so busy recently, and a lot of things have kind of fallen through the cracks, and with everything that falls through the crack, you, you feel more and more like you're letting people down, you're letting your class down, maybe you're letting your, your coworkers down, you're letting your kids down, maybe, and, and it's just like, I'm a failure, right? I'm just letting people down left and right. That's the message. That's the conversation that we have in our mind, right? And that's your thinking. You see, how you think determines what you do in life, right? How you think determines how you live. And how you think, really, it determines who you are. And so the question I want to ask us today as we start is, who are you? Who are you? And is the way that you're thinking in life changing who you are? Is it changing who you proclaim to be? You may not realize this, but uh, we are actually, we've been in a, a sermon series over, since the beginning of the, of the year uh, called Fresh Start. Um, you probably don't realize this because there's been a lot of interruptions uh, in our normal church uh, flow and rhythm over the past few weeks. We've had some good things happening. We've had, we started off, I think, the second week back from Christmas. We started off with Student Week of Prayer and then went into Academy Days and there was a home leave in there. And last week we had Black History Weekend and all good things, but there's been a few other, a few sermons thrown in there throughout uh, on this topic, uh, Fresh Start. And as we started off the new year, we wanted to begin to think about ways that we could have a fresh start when it comes to our walk with God. Pastor David talked about um, uh, really just kind of receiving grace, that if we want a, a fresh start, the word says, my grace is sufficient. My grace is enough for you. And sometimes we just have to let that sink into our hearts and, and sink into our lives for it to really take effect. He talked about committing to spending time with God. I think that so often in this world, God doesn't need to, or you know, Satan doesn't need to make you bad. He just needs to make you busy, right? He just needs to make you busy. And so we need to commit. If we want a fresh start, we need to commit uh, to spending time with him. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, having a fresh start when it comes to renewing your mind. So you know where we're going today. Go ahead and pull out your Bibles if you have it. Um, if you've grown up in church or if you've uh, memorized your memory verses, uh, we're going to be going to uh, Romans chapter 12. And this is not a, a new idea or a concept that we're going to be talking about today, uh, but I want to talk about it and maybe give you something practical that you can take away from this today. So Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Everybody read that first word for me. Therefore, therefore is actually an important word. If you're reading the Bible, uh, it's an important word here because it tells us that there is a transition taking place, right? That, that, that there's a transition in kind of what's being written to us. So Paul's been talking about a lot of doctrine in the book of Romans up to this point. He's been talking about sin, he's been talking about salvation, he's been talking about sanctification, and he's, he's been laying out a lot of theology, it's been like a little bit of a Mr. Salter kind of class, you know, just a lot of theology, a lot of deep stuff, but now Paul is saying, okay, we gotta, we gotta shift gears here, we gotta, we gotta go to application, right, that's important, right, Mr. Salter, application, I, I know you go there too, so, um, so, so he says, therefore, right, something different is happening, Therefore, in light of everything I've talked about in the book of Romans so far, here's what I want the GCA church to do today. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, as living sacrifices, as opposed to dead sacrifices. Paul, as he's writing, and the people who are listening, they know what sacrifices are, right? That's a part of their culture. It was a part of their daily and weekly and yearly routine to, to take sacrifices to the temple and to, you know, slit the throat, and there's blood everywhere, and it, it, it kind of illustrated the, the effects of sin, right? And so, and so they knew what sacrifices were, but Paul is saying not, not 
not that ritual anymore. Like, we don't have to do that anymore. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that I want you to start giving yourself as a living and breathing and moving sacrifice. So he says, give your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That your true and proper worship is to put yourself up on the altar and to give yourself to God and to pray the prayer, God, all of me, I give to you. The Lord, I want to be holy and pleasing to you. How often do we pray that? Lord, I want to be holy and pleasing to you. Please help me to be holy and pleasing in your sight. Paul is saying, if you, can, if you can wrap your mind around this, if you can wrap your mind around giving yourself as a living sacrifice, then you understand what I'm trying to get across here, here in Romans, right? That, that, that you have found what it takes to, to be in uh, favor in the eyes of God. So he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. But then Paul, he starts to think, maybe this is still too much pastor talk here. Maybe this is still too much theology. We've got to give them something practical here today. And so then he, he writes another verse, right? And, I, and, and it's, it's so good, right? It's, it's one of those verses, it's common sense. It's common sense, and yet it's one of those things that we don't practice. It's one of those small things that if we could implement this into our lives, it would make big changes in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. And it's interesting because it's so good and it's so common and it's in something that's so accessible to us, right? It's been, it's in this book that's been sitting on, on the shelf above your desk for, you know, every, you know, last few weeks or maybe months, I don't know. And so Paul gets practical here. He says, do not conform. Everybody say, do not conform. <laughs> yes, do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, stop trying to be like everybody else. Stop trying to live like everybody else. Stop trying to act like everybody else. If you live like everyone else and you act like everyone else and you make the decisions like everyone else and if you date like everyone else and if you spend money like everyone else, then you're going to get the results that everyone else in the world gets. He says, stop. Do not conform to that pattern. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. That there are so many different patterns in this world today. As you read this text and as you begin to apply this text, there, there's so many different patterns that this world has to offer. But one pattern that I want to talk about here this morning is this. There's a pattern in this world that typically people respond to certain events and they form a picture of who they are, that you form a picture of who you are based off of that event. That's a pattern of this world. So, so basically what we end up saying is it's sort of like a math equation. I'm not a math teacher, okay? I don't even begin to, to, to try to do that, but I'm gonna, I have an equation here for you this morning that I heard years ago, and it's one that stuck out to me. So here's the math equation. If X happens to me, why must be true about me. If X happens to me, why must be true about me? You can, you can fill in the blanks there, right? If someone says no to me when I ask them to the banquet, then, you know, I must not, you know, there must be something wrong about, with me, Right? Right, it, it, because I didn't make the, you know, if I didn't make the club, or if I didn't make the team, or if I didn't make the group, you know, then I know there's always drama when that happens, right? Then, then I must not be talented. If X happens to me, Y must be true about me. Because I'm not as athletic as all the guys, or if, because I'm not as athletic as all the other girls, that I'm not going to be appreciated, I'm not going to be valued, I'm not going to be liked, I'm not going to be looked at, I'm going to be last picked, Right? If X happens to me, then Y must be true about me. Because I don't fit the mold that everyone says I need to fit, because I don't look the way that the world says I need to look, then I must not be attractive. 
If X happens to me, then Y must be true about me. But Paul says, do not conform to that pattern. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. What you believe about what happened is ultimately going to determine who you are. But what happens to you doesn't shape who you are. How you process what happens to you, that's what shapes who you are. So we have to be transformed. So that's the next thing he says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. Transformed. So this is an important word here. It's a hopeful word. It says that whatever identity has been formed in you and in your heart, or whatever identity you have assumed because of things that happened to you or, or situations and the way they played out, whatever identity you have assumed in your life, there's good news. That can be transformed. That whatever reputation you have acquired through years and years of decisions and choices you've made, there's good news. You can be transformed, Paul says. Maybe you don't like uh, what happened to you last year, or maybe you got in trouble. Well, good news, you can be transformed from that identity. Maybe you don't like the way that that events have, have taken place in your life. Good news, you can be transformed. You are not what has happened to you. Right? Paul says you can be transformed, and then he continues. Here's what he says. Do not conform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, the mind is a powerful thing. Um, I I really, I see this a lot with with my two kids, um, especially when it comes to food. I don't know if any parents, maybe you know where I'm going with this. But my wife, she's an amazing cook, and she loves to to cook uh, not, the, you know, not just the same things all the time. And so she tries new things, and, and she'll serve up a beautiful plate of food. And my girls will look at that and be like, mm, I don't like that. Like, what do you mean you don't like it? You never even had that. How can you just decide that you don't like that? No, I'm I'm, nope, don't like that. Well, I'm sorry. You're going to have to eat that, right? And, and then it's so funny to watch because it's like, oh, I don't, I don't like that. Okay, well, you have to eat it. Here you go. And, and then it's like, <sighs> right? It's like, you cannot do that. You just decided in your head that you don't like it. You, you know, and it's interesting. Um, Adeline has decided that she does not like butter. I'm like, how do you not like Butter. Butter makes everything better. Everything's better with butter, right? And so we'll have pancakes, and I'll start lathering the pancake with butter because it's so good like that. And Addie's like, no, I don't want that. I don't like butter. And I'm like, what is wrong with you, right? Or, (laughs) or I, you know, we have biscuits, right? If you grow up in the South, you got to have biscuits with butter on it, right? And then you put some jelly on there. It's like a breakfast dessert. And I'm like, okay, I got something. I'm going to make something for you. I put butter on the biscuit with jelly on top, and I serve it. And she's like, uh, really? I'm like, listen, girl, you were born in the South. You have to like biscuits with butter and jelly. I mean, come on, you can't just decide, right? The mind is a powerful thing. One of my favorite quotes, I always remember this quote when I think of this verse. It comes from uh, Henry Ford. Here's what it says. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. The mind is a powerful thing. The mind is also deceptive. I thought this was interesting as I was reading this week um, a book by the author uh, John Acuff. Uh, He talks about that there is a a study out of the University of Michigan Medical School that found out or found that when we experience social rejection, our brain releases the same kind of opioids it releases during a physical trauma. That even when participants knew ahead of time that the social rejection that they were receiving was fake and part of the study, the results were the same. Our brain, when we're experiencing rejection... Even if we know that it's fake rejection, our brain uh, hits the panic button and it dumps opioids into our body to help us survive the perceived trauma. 
So when we face rejection, our mind releases chemicals. Our mind is deceptive. It's, our, our mind is a jerk sometimes, right? It goes on to say um, another thing, which I thought was interesting, um, is that the mind tends to believe what it already believes. You've maybe heard this in another way. Uh, you maybe have heard of the term confirmation bias, that we tend to believe what we already think about ourselves. So we can have an interaction with our kids, right? Or you can have an interaction with your parents, or you, know, you have an interaction with, with somebody, and you're like, ah, like I'm, I'm just a terrible human being. I can never get anything right, because you already think that about yourself, forgetting the whole time that you have, you've had great interactions, and you've done amazing things in the past. But our mind tends to believe what it already wants to think. The mind is deceptive, and the mind is a powerful thing. So Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the question I want to ask today is, well, how do you do that? How do I, how do I fight the mind that is already deceptive? I mean, how, do I be, how am I transformed uh, by the mind? Here's, here's what I'd like to suggest. It's really simple, and then, and then we'll be done here today. Um, renewing your mind. Renewing is replacing. Renewing is replacing, right? To take off the old and to put on the new. Renewing is replacing. It's taking your thoughts, maybe not even your own thoughts, right? Maybe it's the thoughts and the, and the lies that Satan is whispering into your hearts. It's taking those thoughts and replacing them with what is actually true about you, with what God's word says about you. Renewing is replacing. You know, you know, I made a bad decision, so I must be a bad person. Well, no, that, you've got to replace that with I made a bad decision, I learned from my mistake, I've moved on, and it won't happen. Again, renewing is replacing, to take off the old and put on the new, to answer the question, what is true about me? Renewing is replacing. The second thing is renewing is ranking. Renewing is ranking. That simply means that you put what God thinks about you above everybody else. Don't listen to some sophomore or junior and what they say about you, right? Listen to what your heavenly father says about you. Listen to what, listen to what people who actually care about you say about you. You may be a smart person, and you may be a successful person, and maybe people say that to you all the time, and that is true, but listen only to what your father says and heaven says about you. Renewing is replacing, and renewing is ranking. And to the point of what Paul is getting at here, remember, he's been talking about salvation, he's been talking about sanctification, and, and what all of that means. To be renewed, he wants you to, to be transformed spiritually. He wants you to move from death to life. He wants you to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. He wants you to move from an from a earthly perspective to a kingdom perspective. He wants you to be transformed. And we have to do that by being renewed, right? To take off the old and to put on the new. It takes time and it takes effort. And we don't like to hear that sometimes. But we have to continue to replace. And we have to continue to rank. So the question I want to ask today as we wrap this up is who are you going to listen to? Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to your mind, which can be deceptive sometimes? You would think that, that you could trust yourself, but, but Satan works through that. Are you going to listen to, to what a sophomore or junior or senior says about you? Are you going to listen to what Satan, those lies that he constantly whispers into your heart and into your mind? Or are you going to listen to what your heavenly father thinks about you? And so back to the question, who are you? Today, I just want to end by reminding you of who you are. The Bible actually tells us who you are. This is what he thinks about you. That God so loved you that he sent his son to die for you. That's who you are in his eyes. That God has great plans for you. 
plans to prosper you and to give you hope. That he wants to be with you so much that he made a promise that he would never leave you nor forsake you. Even though you feel like he's not around right now, even though you feel distant from God, even though you feel like he hasn't moved and worked and, and shaped and guided your life in a long time, that your feelings are not Lord. What is true is that he said he would never leave you nor forsake you. He says that when you confess your sins, even if it's for, if it's for the hundredth time, that he will forgive you of your sins. Even if it's a struggle that you've had for years and years and years and you can't seem to kick it or you can't seem to get this out of your life, it doesn't matter. He says, when you confess, he forgives you. Let that sink in. That's who you are to him today. He says that you are saved by grace. Right? Not of your own doings, not of your own merits. You are saved by grace through faith. Not of yourselves. It's a gift. That's who you are. He has given that to you. And it's so hard for us to let that sink in and let those things shape and mold our identity. So Paul says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But then there's a reward to this. He says, then, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. I mean, don't you want to know what God's will is for your life? Wouldn't it be nice if you knew how to test and approve his will? Wouldn't it be great if, 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 I mean, if you had the clarity? I mean, don't you want the clarity in your life to be able to know and to think and to just see how to think about the world and see how to view the world and see how to test and approve how God is moving and working and shaping the world? I mean, isn't that what you want? Don't you want to know what God wants for your life? I don't know about you, but I want to know what God's plan is for my life. And I think that truly we all want to know what God's plan is. And maybe we should begin with daily renewing our mind to, to our, our true identity in Christ Jesus.
Let's bow our heads for prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this Sabbath. And Lord, as we enter into a new week, we pray, Lord, that we would experience the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the ability to uh, replace the voices or the identity or whatever it is with the voice of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.